Good evening, everyone. It's the sound okay? Folks online, you can hear me okay? Thank you, Doug. I'm Stacy McClendon. I'm one of the teachers here at Common Ground. Thanks for spending your Friday evening reflecting on love, the capacity of our hearts to receive and express love. It's a great way to spend a Friday evening. Great way to end a week, just the middle or beginning of your week. So we'll start with a sit together. Share some reflections that are written in the Metta book. That sits by the, the Kuan Yin here at the center. It's a sweet way to bring into our hearts others in the community, offering care and support. I'll share a little Dharma reflection and hopefully there'll be some time and interest in you all sharing your dharma reflections. So hopefully at home you have what you need to be comfortable as we sit for the next half hour or so. Find a posture that is both relaxed and supports a, an alert inquiry. The spine straight but soft. You might begin with a few deep inhalations, exhaling slowly. Just inviting the nervous system to settle. Noticing what we're arriving with. The quality of the heart and mind as we pause. And the doing and busyness that often fills our days. Noticing where there's maybe tension or tightness in the body. And this doesn't have to be a problem. You can turn a kind, patient attention to this area. Breathing in ease, breathing out 
allowing and releasing. Allowing what needs to be. Releasing that which doesn't support this intention, this effort. Coming into balance. creating the conditions for a resting place. A place where we can be undefended, where we feel relatively safe. A place of little or no resistance. We might bring to mind space, maybe it's a physical place or with another living being, perhaps it's an activity, writing, creating. It has a scent of warmth. Where we feel held. The goodness of our heart is unbounded. Perhaps it's a memory of being with a loved one and cared for, being adored. Allowing ourselves to rest. place of deep, tender care.
if we notice resistance or mind that wants to set some sort of qualifier judgment. We can gently set that aside to say, not now. Allow, allow ourselves to be washed over, bathed in this loving kindness. Seen, cared for just as we are. Imperfect. Perfect. Just as we are.
we take a short break, two or three minutes, if you like. Maybe say hello to your neighbor. Say hello online. Drop a hello in the, the chat. Well, it seems that um, folks online are maybe having some difficulty hearing me. Uh, is there is there a computer, a mic that hooks to the computer? One or two? Two. Because one is for the sound system here and one is maybe for the computer. Okay, uh, just another minute and we'll check in the media cabinet to see, see what we can find. The last time I forgot this camera, and so everyone online got a terrible view from this camera. So if you came back, thank you for coming back. Ah, this is the difficulty with that mic, is that I have an old computer and there is not an adapter for, yeah. So. <clears throat> I think <laughs> Is this any better? Okay. All right, Jessica said yes, it's a little bit better. So, all right, thank you. I feel like weighted down with mics. <laughs> thank you, Chelsea. Ah, again, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, it's nice to uh, bring the other folks in our community into the space, into our practice. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a, I don't know, I call it a meta book, maybe just call it a love notebook in the, in the corner where uh, community members can request wishes of well-being or uh, just share what's on their hearts. And it's nice to, uh, yeah, just take that in. So Chelsea will graciously read um, the notes that have been written over the last month. Yeah, I have two, it's okay. 
I can share. Okay, wait, this is not this. Is, Pray for me and my family as change comes into our lives. For SDL and their journey in treatment. For me, I am glad I have chosen life. Thank you for saving my life. For all those living with chronic illness, may they be happy, healthy, and supported. Grateful for all the beautiful blooms and blossoms. May Kay receive deep healing, comfort, and peace. And then something in another language that I think says, Boyo, Bohi, Bohi. Metta to all beings everywhere, near and far, great and small, seen and unseen. When we allow ourselves to be soft, sort of tenderized by love or loving kindness or care. There's uh, a lessening of resistance to difficulty or challenge. So the loving kindness or metta, compassion, sympathetic joy, equanimity, these qualities of heart that are said to be sort of the salve for all social ills, all the relationship difficulties. Called the divine abodes, like this resting place for the heart, for the mind. And I, I really, I really love that image of like this divine home, right? An abode where we can be undefended, Where we're known, I, I imagine a grandmother or a loving person just holding my face and just fully loving me up with all of my flaws, imperfections, right? There's not this confusion that I'm a perfect being or that I can do no wrong. But there are no limits to that expression of care. And this practice of resting there, like allowing ourselves to be held there, I think is something we don't do often. Right? We categorize or figure out like, oh, not that person because of that history or find ourselves not deserving for some reason that we've created or made up ourselves. But it's a really sweet practice to rest in this place of feeling cared for and loved. Often times, uh, my kids, when they're making up games or playing, and many games, right? There is a 
a home base or a place that is home that is you're protected you're safe like even if they tag you or spray you or hit you like it doesn't count right because you're home and you may get annoyed or ticked off but you remember like oh it doesn't mean anything because i'm home i'm safe and I imagine cultivating the same sense in my grown up life out in the world, both undefended and perfectly protected by this loving shield. And when we're sitting in practice with this intention or reflection, it becomes really clear where our habitual resting place is, right? A lot of times for me, it's a little bit of crank, right? It's a little bit of eh, looking for the thing that's wrong, looking for what's broken. And maybe it's similar for you, someone here chuckled, so <laughs> it might resonate, right? And we get to choose. Like, is this the place that I want my heart, my mind to rest, right? And even beyond the, what I want, it's this practice of investigation. Like it does this resting place, this way of relating to experience, does it support this intention to connect with other human beings, other living beings? To lessen the stress and distress in our lives. We see where we're holding on to, holding on to an idea, holding on to preferences, holding on to old wounds. And we need not judge this. This is all human nature. This is all nature, right? But it's an opportunity for us to really be interested and take stock in what we're feeding what we're fueling, the home that we're building, this resting place. And this uh, practice of cultivating loving kindness, it, it's actually less doing, right? I'm gonna sit down, I'm going to be loving, or I'm going to be nice. Right. It's an orientation of the heart, of the mind, a relaxing of those habit ways. Like we have to be interested in, yeah, the expressions of our heart, our mind, just as they are before we sit down to transform anything at all. We have to get close to and understand, know what's come to be. And it really is a sort of assessment. Is this working? And we get to ask ourselves, is this way of othering, distancing, is it bringing ease? At the same time, resisting our habit to judge, right? Well, I'm this age. Good golly, I'm 55 years old. I should have this figured out by now. This, uh... Metta asks a lot of us. It's akin to 
a garden and I don't know if uh, any of you are growing anything like it's gardening season right you don't just go to the friend's plant sale which I love to go to buy your favorite or wherever you go or grow from seed and plant it into the hard dry soil there's this preparing of the soil for this young tender plant or the seed. And the same with our minds, right? Understanding the decades of conditioning that has come to make this hard, dry soil of the mind, this fixed way of seeing the world. And even if you're a gardener, you know, you can weed and amend the soil and fertilize and put down just the right mulch, create all of the conditions for this beautiful plant to thrive and grow. And it still could be overtaken by weeds, right? To, uh, there's an area in my garden right now, and we like totally redid it in the fall, and they are persistent. <laughs> they are determined. And somehow we, we accept this in nature. Like, ah, is it, and it can actually be fascinating. Like we laid down a, a concrete pad for a new shed and like right at the corner, like something is sprouting out. It's a bleeding heart. So I'm glad that it made it through. But like, that's actually quite amazing. That despite being completely disrupted, conditions completely revamped, that it persisted. And still with our own minds, we're not as welcoming to the same pattern. Right? Like, oh, well, I did therapy for five years, or I've been meditating for 10 years. The same stuff keeps coming up. And so we abandon the cushion or we say, that's not for me. Yeah. It doesn't work. Right? We can't... Uh, We like the soil, <laughs> right? We can do our best and persist. So this uh, definition of meditation now, often, oftentimes we come into it thinking, ah, I'm going to clear the mind. I'm going to be totally calm and blissed out. And the, the work of meditation is actually creating the conditions, preparing the soil, creating the conditions for these qualities of heart, mind, to grow, evolve, naturally and over time. Over time being the operative words, right? We uh, encounter ourselves and our conditioning over and over and over, or we just spend a meditation, a sit, planning, plotting, right? Something else. It doesn't support this balance. And that's not quite meditation. It might feel productive. But it's a practice of remembering, really. Remembering what's useful and skillful. Right? That's like we're remem we in the meditation, we, we remembered that experience of feeling cared for 
and also remembering what's not skillful, what hasn't been useful. And not in a way to shame ourselves or blame ourselves, but in as a way to remember what not to repeat, right? Having some understanding that we don't actually have to do that again. And it's wise, skillful to call that to mind when we are caught up in our thoughts or we're in a situation. Right? It's useful to remember, oh yeah, <laughs> I've been here before. And this way hasn't really worked for me. And not as a personal failing, but as a relational learning, right? Or this coming back home to a place of care for ourselves, for ourselves first. Right? Sometimes as understood to be a spiritual bypass to go to all beings. Right? And sometimes uh, we are our own difficult person or sometimes we're the neutral person. And it's not so much the categories of people that are in the uh, very traditional metta practice. It's a methodical way to actually erase those boundaries, erase those categories of people, right? It was just this embodying of care. There's some uh, teachers that talk about uh, radiating out metta or care, which sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't, uh, but it's, uh, I think the instruction is uh, more that this is not an efforting to be loving kindness, to be compassion, but really being interested in the qualities that are arising in our own heart and mind that support that or are a barrier to that. I, um, I reference this book often, uh, David Rico, it's uh, How to Be an Adult in Relationships, five, what, uh, five Keys to Mindful Loving. Um, and it really uh, resonates with this idea of understanding our conditioning and being at home in, in love, right. not in um, a perfect love. This idea of love that we have, I think sometimes is quite fanciful, right? And it's very conditional. If you are, if you have, if you give. But he talks about attention, acceptance, allowing, appreciation, and affection, which are not unlike uh, uh, at all uh, many of the principles that we reflect on in practice, right? This... Uh, attention, being fully present, this generosity of interest in another, right? What your sort of sensitivity to someone else's needs, which are not undifferent, undifferent, unlike our own. Um, 
this acceptance or equanimity we might think of it as it's unconditional, unresounding, just yes, it is like this, imperfect, ever-changing, right? Not revolving around me and my needs. And how how often are we really able to relax in our care for one another to be able to, to receive someone in their own imperfections, all of their misgivings, and not as an endorsement or But just as in the meditation, I see you. The, the practice or uh, this allowing or acceptance. is a necessary component to transforming not only our relationship to ourselves, our own hearts, but to other people. Like seeing what is, seeing what is before it can be rooted out. If it needs to even be rooted out. Right? And when we turn away, when we choose willful ignorance or we choose to have a head in our, our head in the sand, choosing not to know, sort of willful to dial, it makes it impossible to get close to, to understand. And certainly impossible to appreciate or uh, practice any sort of gratitude. The Buddha uh, called gratitude for difficulty advanced gratitude. It's like graduate level, right? Gratitude. But I understand that to mean recognizing that there is a teacher in all experience. Right? No one's going out looking for difficulty or strife in our lives. And it's also not to say that we aren't impacted, that there isn't hurt, there isn't residue from trauma or difficulty. But can there also be some learning, some insight and growth. I think the appreciation is uh, maybe one of the most challenging diff uh, elements in a relationship. I've been married for almost 15 years and uh, expressing gratitude for things that uh, Maybe at my core or a habitual response is, oh, well, it could have been different or it could have been better, right? Like, oh, well, I wouldn't have done it that way. And I don't know about you, but I see that in myself in many places, right? This comparison. And it's just, that's conceit. That's the Buddha's... Uh, sort of explanation, this comparing, better than, less than, equal to. And at the center of that, the self. Right? Can there be some simple appreciation without the comparing, without the judging? Appreciating someone's expression of difficulty or deep emotion or vulnerability 
And it doesn't mean that we agree, but can we see the tenderness in that expression? And maybe like me, uh, you didn't necessarily grow up in a place where these qualities were appreciated and nurtured. And so as a result, we develop defenses, right? Protections, not wanting to be seen or not trusting others to hold us in care. And that gets to be part of our experience too, right? And not as a justification for remaining crunchy, right? Closed off. But like remaining interested in how we got here and how that has served us in our relationships. This allowing or equanimity that we talk about, I think it's misconstrued and can be super confusing because it's not this passive acceptance of harmful or hurtful behavior at all. But this understanding that just like the, those weeds that burst through the soil despite all of our efforts, there are conditions that have been set in motion for a long time that we've contributed to. For things to be the way they are right now. And it's not blame. I, maybe that's where my mind goes. I think I've said that many times. Like my mind goes to blame. It does. My mind goes to blame. Like whose fault is this? And even in identifying whose fault that is has not always been a gratifying experience. Once you pin the person down, you still have the thing, right? You still have the difficulty. You still have the discord and that's what i mean talking about just this examination does this actually serve me this process and it's it's a difficult thing to shake those habit responses because my mind is certainly conditioned like no, no, this will make you feel better if you can figure out whose fault this is. And sort of righteousness, not sort of self-righteousness. No. And so the... practice to orient the mind toward what's healing, what's good, and not good in a right or wrong, but that supports wisdom, that supports our capacity to meet it, the shit show, the happy times from this place of care, the capacity to care for and allowing ourselves to be cared for. And wisdom, um, Wisdom teaches us that we can recognize the good and appreciate it, feel it without being attached to it. 
Just like we, we recognize and maybe appreciate in our more balanced and skillful moments, the difficulty. Hmm. Sayadaw Utejaniya says, uh, wisdom always investigates. Like even when we think we know this is good, this will work. And we continue to explore, we continue to question. Like, is this a useful resting place for my mind? And when it's not, we go about cleaning house, right? Letting go of relaxing those habit ways of responding, right? Reactive patterns or judgment where we hold grudges, seeing our own biases, And it's not, I mean, it can be useful to have a sort of public confession, not in this forum, right? But someone in our lives who we care for, that cares for us, that we can, we have some relative trust to reflect back the ways that we're showing up in the world. Because I think I'm pretty good most of the time. Or else I think I'm absolutely terrible. There's not a whole lot of in between. Right? Where do we get this balanced reflection? Hopefully it's Sangha, family, friends, right? That we can receive receive that feedback, receive that reflection of the impact, the imprint that we are leaving because we make one. Everything we touch, we leave an imprint. Everything, the, the thought like, oh, well, this doesn't really matter or I'll do, better next time like right now is everything right now is absolutely everything and it matters how we regard one another how we ignore one another or dismiss one another this is the creation of causes and conditions for what comes next. I imagine that if you're a parent, that you reflect on this in many ways over a long period of time. I don't have children. There are children in my life that are both uh, adults and young. And I see the inclination toward this care being conditional, like the withholding, like if you could do a little better, not, you know, not explicitly. I'm not sure what it is that brings me back to <laughs> this reflection of that's not really useful. This withholding of care or withholding of kindness, withholding of generosity. Hmm. 
a bit of faith, I think it is. It goes like saving, uh, I don't know why I thought of this, saving like a new pair of shoes or a new anything for a special occasion, right? Why withhold care or kind words for some special occasion? It's like uh, we don't want a young person or maybe an adult to get the wrong idea, right? That I care about you even though you're not on the path that I want you to be on. Or that my care somehow is an endorsement of poor decisions or poor judgment. Can it just be care? Can we even deliver a truth? Maybe it's disappointment or can we deliver it with care? I, I really hold this idea of this resting place of love being home and any, anything can come to this home that is built in love. And it won't flatten me. I might get confused or turned around for a moment. It's like the, the warmth of it draws me back. Hmm. Yeah, I think that, hmm. I think maybe the, the last thing that I'll say, um, I think it's something that I just heard within the last couple of years that was both uh, super surprising and reassuring that um, Metta is not about having this warm, loving feeling, right? Metta is uh, an intention. It's a intentional action, an intentional orientation of the mind. I remember being on retreat and just um, really early in my practice, being confused about how useful sitting on a cushion, way someplace nice, while there's like mayhem happening in the world, like how that could actually be useful. And I find still, I want action, right? I want this chaotic world to be transformed. And this is how it happens. Like one person at a time choosing kindness in every moment without exception, without discriminating. I still yell and swear in my car at people when I'm driving. <laughs> Less swearing. It is true. That's true. I just realized that. Less swearing. Uh, <laughs> still a little yelling, right? But I'm yielding, even as I'm yelling, right? I'm yielding. I, I think that's how it happens. It's the softening over time. The staying at home in love.
<laughs> so I won't swear at you. I'll just yell at you. <laughs> um, this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, Bertram, Bertram Russell. The good life as I see it is a happy life. I do not mean that if you are good, you will be happy. I mean that if you are happy, you will do good. And so we're not setting out to be the perfect people who do all of the right things, who say all of the right things. People simply interested in creating the conditions to grow an open, loving heart. So that when someone on the, in the car on the road is yelling and swearing at you, right, you can wish them ease, <laughs> wish them peace. I hope it won't be me. <laughs> yeah. I think I'll leave it there. Um, we have a few minutes if anyone has their own reflections on Meta in your life. It's always, always nice to hear how folks are uh, putting these teachings, this practice into motion. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thinking about um, I have one more week of school. I work in the schools, and talking about the one person at a time. Um, you know, just being with a student, and um, and just seeing them. It's really powerful. And then other students seeing all of it, you know, it's just really um, one person at a time. And then I go out in the hallway and it's just, you know, the last week of school is pretty rowdy. Like, how do you tell a whole hallway of students to, to not yell? <laughs> you know, they're so excited. And so it is that that mayhem and that, um, but being open to it, like being, having joy, like I, I, I reflect on like COVID and people were at home and now everyone's together and they're touching and walking and bumping and it's great. Because I do think of the kids being at home and missing all that. It's a lot. But, um, Meta practice really helps me to um, treat each person like a person, you know, where they're at and where I'm at and um, be ignored and be engaged. And <laughs> so I'm grateful for uh, having this to come back to, to remember when I'm lost and being snarky and going, oh, yeah, okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. You know, it just feels good to have a practice like this to pull up. Yeah. The, the school, your share reminded me, I was out walking my dog this morning and I couldn't even see it, but I, I heard it. You, you know, the sound of the school bus doors opening and I could hear someone singing happy birthday. Even and as I came around the corner, even before the person, the student was on the bus and you could just see in their 
like buoyancy, how happy that made them. Right? It's a simple happy birthday. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Over here, are they on camera? I totally forgot to turn the camera. Hi, my name's Jay. Um, I just appreciate the kind of emphasis on Meta as feeling safe and creating a sense of internal safety. Because um, I think for a long time, like things were happening. One was that like Meta was not working for me in the traditional the phrases. Um, I just felt kind of like pissed off or angry or and then you know like just piling on the judgment of like everyone else is feeling so great and I'm feeling shitty and um and so there was like that plus like everyone kept talking about compassion and I was like okay fine but like how do you, how, how do I do that I don't know how to like actually practice that um and I think too just being in the world from both microaggressions and aggression like really having a, a very damaged sense of basic safety in the world. And uh, those two things being connected, right? It's like, I don't feel safe, so I'm going to, like, you know, project hate or judgment outward as a defense. And uh, so, yeah, I just feel like it really all comes together in this idea of, like, meta as cultivating a sense of inner safety and like the power of visualization um and i know you know in like trauma healing too they talk about like cultivating as a space that you can go to sort of like in your mind um yeah being able to do that as meta and seeing that as meta is incredibly powerful and i it just recognizes like the more trauma-informed element too of our practice um that you know, we're not all at the place of we're going to say the phrases in this distinct order and, you know, radiate it outwards. Um, and I appreciate what you said about spiritual bypass, because I think that's very true. At least for me, it always felt like bypass to immediately just start saying these phrases when, you know, like caring for my own wounding is what really needed to happen. And just being able to see through doing that practice, having that internal safe space that it's the same thing that when I feel safe and cared for, that that is, you know, I can project that out. So thank you. There's a Hindu sage, uh, Mah Maharashi, I think, who had um, like a, a near near death experience as a teenager and then went. Uh, into the mountains to practice and teach and a uh, student made the trek up the mountain to ask a question and asked, uh, you know, like there's all this stuff happening, people against people, like, how are we supposed to treat other people when they are, you know, fill in the blank? And he said, there are no others. There are no others. We often, uh, common ground, oh, I keep forgetting to turn the camera, sorry. Zoom people, sorry. Um, at common ground, um, on retreats for sure, uh, the morning chant is a four quarters chant of the divine abodes. Uh, it's like love embodying love when love meets like joy that's uh, sympathetic joy when love meets difficulty we call that compassion but for each one there's a line and to all as to myself and i love that it's even like drawn out right for like emphasis for me it feels like for emphasis right the all as to myself. And some of us are really good at loving ourselves up 
and we like sort of hoard that and we meter it out to others. And for some of us, it's the other way around, right? We're short on the love for ourselves and we're super generous with others. Yeah, Robert, you get the last word. I want to be respectful of people's time. Yeah, come on up. I was just going to mention that I do the uh, divine abodes, loving kindness, Christian joy, equanimity, but I followed it up with the five recollections of, um, of nature. You've been offered a chair. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I follow up the, the divine abodes with the five recollections of um, a nature to sicken, nature to age, nature to die, and um, all that I have, beloved and pleasing, shall be otherwise. And then it goes to, I am the owner of my karma, abide by my karma, and so on. Any karma that I do, for good or for ill, of that I will be the heir. But I very quickly recollect. And when I do both of them together, I get caught to the loving kindness. <laughs> <laughs> because this is it, right? This is it. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. That's a lovely way to end. Thank you all for uh, your kind attention and spending your Friday evening with me. Uh, do we have announcements, Chelsea? No? All right. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Oh, Zoom, folks. I'm so sorry. I think I'd remember this big light I face. But... <laughs> Uh, take care, everyone, and have a good weekend. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone.